Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Reformers Unanimous' third talk. If you're brand new to Reformers Unanimous, never been here before, don't know what REU is, we are a Christ-centered, Bible-based addiction recovery program that's designed to recover, to rescue, and to restore those that are trapped in addictive behaviors, bad habits, through the power of a victorious life that is found only in relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're getting ready to start third talk. What does that mean? Well, if we were in the church building where we normally meet, we have three talks. First talk is where we talk to God in praises and testimonies. And I encourage you to continue to do that, even if we're not meeting. Take time when you're driving your car. Take time in your morning over your coffee cup to just review the day yesterday, last week, and say, thank you, God. Thank you for life, for breath, for family, for income, for a roof over my head. Kenny always says, thank you for the big windshield. And uh, just, I encourage you to do that. It's, uh, it's good practice, and it, it actually um, is a positive experience mentally for you. And God likes to hear that you're paying attention to the things that he's doing. Second talk, which if we were in our church building, we would break into small groups, and we would work on our challenges. And those challenges are what are designed to help us to build that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through him that we find liberty and freedom. And then third talk, which we're going to have right now, is when we let God talk to us through a message from his word. So this is going to sound like preaching, but it's actually part of the addiction recovery process. It's learning to think differently. It's learning to think biblically. And I'm hoping that uh, tonight will be a blessing to you. Let's pray real quick. Lord God, I want to thank you for loving us. And we just pray, God, that you'd help us now as we get into third talk. Make visitors feel welcome. Let those that um, are frequent attenders feel loved as well. And uh, may everybody be, uh, that uh, comes in the hearing of my voice, God, just get a blessing. Help them to understand. Help me to understand. Help us to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right. So it is always awkward. I'm talking to my iPhone just to be transparent. And my iPhone doesn't talk back. So it's always a little awkward. Um, but I'm going to try to bring you a message today that I think is um, beneficial. It's something that I've seen. It's something that my wife has noticed. And it's something I've seen in my own life. So I'm hoping that this is helpful to you. And uh, we're going to start off in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. I'll give you a second to get there. I'm already there. Romans chapter 7 is the frustrated Christian. Um, the Apostle Paul, who's writing in Romans, um, he's talking about the law and sin and the flesh. And in a nutshell, he says, I would not have even known about sin had the commandment of God not said, don't do this. I would have just gone about my business, lying, cheating, stealing. I never knew it was wrong. I thought it was just me being me. But then the word of God came. And the word of God said, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You know, and whenever God said that, that sin, the knowledge of sin revived. And he says, and I died. Because the, because the payment of sin is death. Wages of sin is death. That's what it says in the Bible. And so he notices within himself in Romans chapter 7 a battle that's going on. And the first battle is, is the law good? Because the law woke up sin in my flesh. If, if, if nobody had told me it was wrong, I would have never known it was wrong. But now that I know it's wrong, I have this internal struggle between right and wrong. <clears throat> and it's, it's, is it the fault of the law? Is it the fault of the commandment? No, it's not. You know, um, I have kids. I have three children that I have raised. Um, Hannah's graduating. Alex has graduated. And Noah's 14 and going to get there soon. And one of the things that happens is kids do things that they shouldn't do. They do things that they know they shouldn't do, but there are other things they just don't know. And so you will go up to them as a parent and you will say these words. You're not supposed to do that. And you're the lawgiver. And when you, as the parent, become the lawgiver, there's an internal struggle that happens in the child. And the child, the struggle is, <clears throat> is the law good? 
Or is the law bad? <clears throat> because the law woke up that error in me. That made me aware that I was doing wrong. So I don't like that law anymore. I, used, I tell my kids, I still tell my kids, stop making me the bad guy, right? I don't want to be the bad guy, but I'll be the bad guy. But part of being the bad guy is telling them that what they're doing is wrong. And they look at you like, I never ever had that thought before in my whole life. Wow, that's, I hadn't thought of that. And you, if you're a parent, you know this. And a lot of times, they instantaneously lash back at you because you're the lawgiver. Rather than looking at themselves and saying, hey, that woke up the knowledge of sin in me and I need to repent of it, they push back. And that's exactly what happens in Romans chapter 7. Whenever he starts talking in verse 7, he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, watch, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. Concupiscence is just a fancy word of overflowing sinfulness. <clears throat> All those wrong things got woken up in me. It's kind of like, you know, as a parent, there are some things you don't want to expose your kids to because you know that if you expose it to them once, they're going to just keep on doing it. Um, you don't ever want to swear around your kids because if you, you shouldn't swear at all. Don't even do pre-cussing, right? You start using pre-cussing and then that becomes cussing. But anyway, but you don't want to do it around your kids. Even the world doesn't cuss around their kids. I mean, some do, but, you know, they try not to because they're kids and we don't want to expose them to that. Why don't we want to expose them to that? Because it'll become a part of who they are and will become, then they'll start seeing that in themselves, right? In, the, in, their, in their kids. And so we try not to wake that up in them, that rebellion, that disrespect. Okay, so we try not to do that. Um, a lot of parents will, will, um, will do things for their children or around their children just because they don't want to wake up sin in the flesh of the kids. It's just true. It says, for without the law, verse 8, for without the law, sin was dead. So that sin was there, It was, but it wasn't doing anything. There's no motions of sin. There was no activity of sin. It says, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now, I'm not going to go through an totally give you an exposition of Romans chapter 7. I just want you to understand that there was a, a conflict in the apostle, and there's a conflict in us. When someone tells us that what we're doing is wrong, we push back on them and say they're wrong. And he says, but no, I had to eventually look at myself and say, no, the fault was in me. The commandment came and the sin in me revived. And that caused another conflict in me because now I've got the inner man and especially if you're saved, you've got the inner man, the renewed man, the Christian, who wants to do what's right. But you've got this sin that's been awakened in your flesh that wants to do wrong. Um, some people talk about an old man and a new man. And um, the, the truth is, I have a new man. The old man is gone, but the old man is gone for my spirit. And the old man is being gone for my soul. And the old man is still sticking around for my body. And he answers this in uh, Romans 7, 17, where he says that now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. All right, so stop, because that's a little bit confusing and it might go over somebody's head. In this body, your body's not fixed yet, right? You don't have your supernatural body that can go through walls and go from here to there in a blink of an eye that doesn't have to eat, that doesn't need to sleep, you're going to get that body if you're a Christian. You're going to get that body when Jesus comes back. But you don't have that body yet. Right now, the body that you've got is still the body that you were born with from your mother's womb. And that body is made up of skin and bones and blood. And inside that skin and bone and blood is iniquity. It's the, it's the motions of sin. It's that bent away from God. My flesh wants to do what my flesh wants to do, and it never stops and says, is it right by Jesus? My flesh will does not ask, does God want me to fast today? 
My flesh doesn't ask that. My flesh says, if you punch me, I punch you back. My flesh resists God at every turn because it's got sin in it. It's got iniquity still in it. It doesn't have a new body yet. One day it will, but not yet. Now in my spirit, I'm a new person and I only want what's right. I only want right now. If you could see my spirit, if you could grab the zipper in my forehead, pull it back up and over and pull it apart, you would see the shiny brand new son of God that I am. And if you're saved, you could do the same thing with you. I could grab the zipper, pull it over, and oh, the we could see the glorious appearing of the children of God, right? And that man on the inside is always praising God, always loving God, always worshiping God, always obedient and willing and desiring to serve and to love and to honor God and to give him praise and and now there's now there's a there's a conflict between my inner man that's always serving and loving God and my outer man that still has sin in the flesh <clears throat> none of that's what I'm talking to you about today in third talk <laughs> but I had to lay a groundwork I had to lay a groundwork now the groundwork goes like this this flesh fights against the inner man. This flesh doesn't want to honor, praise, and love God. This flesh doesn't want to do what Jesus wants me to do. This flesh wants to go to the First Baptist Church of Serta mattresses on Sunday morning. This flesh does not want to love God. All right? So what happens is, I'm talking to those that have had addictions. Raise your hand. Every hand should be raised. If you've ever had an addiction, yes. Here's what happens. When you put that one addiction down and you do it through the power of the flesh, what happens? And you've seen this yourself. Where'd that come from? Oh, oh, it's back. Well, I don't want to do that anymore. I'll give you an example. I don't want to smoke anymore. So instead, I'm going to overeat. I don't want to overeat anymore. So instead, I'll become addicted to exercise. When I was a kid, I I did this. I did everybody's done this. I bounced back and forth a little bit. I can remember as a kid where I went through this phase of I couldn't stop lying. Everywhere I went, I just told lies. Innuendos, but mainly lies and just stretching it, exaggerating it, usually to make myself look good. Um, I wasn't willing to humble myself and tell the full truth. It always made me the shiny object, right? And I was addicted to lying. I really was. And I can remember praying and saying, God, I, I can't do this, man. This is crazy. As I tried to put down lying, I actually became a gossip. Now I became telling the truth about everybody and everything. I didn't intend for that. I just didn't want to lie anymore. But as I pushed it down, my flesh said, oh, okay, here's a new one for you. And I started gossiping instead and talking about people. Um, we see it all the time in um, addiction recovery, and especially addiction recovery that is not Jesus-based. Is, And this is the title of the third talk. Are you swapping addictions or are you finding real freedom? Are you just swapping addictions or are you finding real freedom? And we see over and over again where people come in and they're just going to swap one addiction for another. Um, they're just going to stop doing this and start doing this instead. Now, that's okay if your other addiction is Jesus because Jesus makes people free. But that's usually not what it is. Usually people just come in and they get religious. That's not right because it won't last. Or, as I said, they'll stop doing this and they'll start overeating because that's an acceptable addiction. Or they'll start working out too much because that's an acceptable addiction. The goal of Reformers Unanimous is not for you to swap one bad addiction for an acceptable addiction. It's for you to be free. The goal for Reformers Unanimous, the goal for the Lord Jesus Christ, is for you to be free, to find freedom. This flesh, because there's sin in it, is sneaky. I, I had a message once called Sneaky Flesh. I preach it all the time, um, probably half a dozen times in my, in my years. Sneaky Flesh. This flesh will say, oh, you don't want to do that? Do this instead. And I'll leave the blanks there because you do things that are different than me. Oh, you don't want to do that? Do this instead. And it'll trick you and you think you're finding freedom, but you're really not. 
you're instead swapping one bad addiction for another addiction. Uh, don't do that. That's not freedom. That's not liberty. That's not what Jesus made you for. Your purpose is not to be going from um, chains of steel to chains of velvet. Your, your goal, God's purpose for your life is to have liberty. Liberty. So let me, let me show you another verse. Our RU verse, chap, chapter John uh, 8, 32, verse 8, 32 in John, it says this, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But he goes on down there in verse 36 where he says this, If the Son, that's Jesus Christ, therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. The problem is, is most people have never felt what it's like to be free indeed. They just go from one addiction to another addiction to another addiction to another addiction and they just keep swapping and they don't know what it's like to have a life that just doesn't have addictions to be free to walk at liberty if the sun shall therefore make you free you shall be free indeed john 8 32 says that if you know the truth the truth shall make you free and in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. So if you know Jesus, know Jesus, you get to be free. That's why we used to talk about the power of a victorious life that's found only in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot manufacture the liberty that Jesus gives by just pushing down one and subbing something that's more socially acceptable. Maybe I put this down and I lifted this up because this is less deadly, right? I'm not going to blame somebody if they want to stop doing this and start doing this because it's less deadly. But I would rather, I would rather that they learned what true liberty was. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Are you just swapping addictions or are you finding real freedom? Look in um, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3. 17. Some um, favorite verse of many. If you don't have it memorized, I would encourage you. Now the Lord is that Spirit. Capital S, that's the Holy Spirit. The Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Not chains that are softer. Not chains that are more comfortable. Liberty. There's liberty. There's freedom. Look in... Um, let me show you. Let me, let me go through. I'm going to show you a couple things. Um, Galatians chapter 5. I'm not going to flip a lot of verses, but I just want to show you a couple. Galatians chapter 5. Um, I'm not apologizing for flipping. This is where the truth is found. But I know in a short message, there can be a lot of flipping and it makes people tired. Um, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren and sisters, we don't want to leave you out. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. So he's saying this. Um, i got to read it again. It's getting old, guys. My brain's not working. <laughs> You've been called unto liberty, only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. So, some people, when they get saved, they get freedom. They get freedom from whatever it is, and then instead of walking in that liberty, they go and say, well, I have freedom, and they go and pick up another addiction, a different addiction. Again, probably one of the most common ones is they become religious, which is an addiction to self. It's an addiction to self. Um, that's what religion is. Look at me. Look at me. I'm pleasing God. Mm -hmm. Yes, let me, let me tell you what my Bible says. Mm -hmm. Yes, And it, it's not the spirit that, that, that God wants you to have. You're supposed to not use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. And in order to not do that, you have to realize first and foremost that your flesh is trying to trick you. Your flesh and my flesh, even if you're saved, is trying to keep you in bondage. Your flesh is trying to trick you so that you won't have that liberty that you're supposed to have. 
he gives you one of the answers right here. Instead of using that liberty and letting your flesh get the upper hand, once God has given you that liberty, use it to love others. Use that liberty to love others. You know, I think it's in uh, at the end of 1 Corinthians, it says we have addicted ourselves to the ministry of the saints. That's a good addiction. That's the only time I think in the Bible that the word addiction occurs. They've addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I'm going to go serve others, serve others, serve others, serve others. My flesh is going to hate it. Oh, because I'm serving others. I'm not serving me. But I'm walking in liberty while I do it. My flesh doesn't feel at liberty. My flesh feels in bondage. My flesh feels like it's lost control. But I'm not serving my flesh. I'm serving the inner man. And the inner man is happy and delighted because I'm free. I'm free. Let me show you another verse. Um, John 17. John 17. And verse 17. This is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, sanctify them. Sanctify them, my disciples, through thy truth, talking to the Father, thy word is truth. The word sanctify means to set apart. It means to set apart. It means to separate you from. This Bible can help to separate you from those chains and from those addictions and to make it real liberty for you. Remember, Jesus is the word made flesh. And this Bible, when used correctly and properly and honoring it, can help you to actually walk in real liberty. So if you have to become an addicted to something, guys, get addicted to the things that are in here. Get addicted to this. Get addicted to, to yielding to the Holy Spirit. Get addicted to saying, Lord God, fill me today with your love, your joy, your peace, your long-suffering, your gentleness, your goodness, your faith, your meekness, a temperance. Against such there is no law. You get addicted to that. You get addicted to the Holy Spirit. You get addicted to yielding to Him and being separated by the Word of God at work in your life. And you'll have real liberty. You'll have real liberty, not a manufactured liberty that comes from pushing one down and having another pop up. You'll have real liberty. And I'm going to end on this verse because this I didn't see this this way before. 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'll get there in a minute. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 24. It says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive. You know those preachers that are in people's faces and yelling and screaming and calling them names? They haven't read this verse. <laughs> the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if peradventure, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, watch, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So this is talking about you and me. Somebody, somebody humbly, meekly presented us the word of truth. They, they, presented us tru they presented it to us. They didn't strive. They were gentle. They gave us, and we acknowledged it. We acknowledged it. We repented, and, and God set us free. And it says that they may recover themselves out of the snare. You as a Christian, you as a lost person, you as a person who doesn't know Jesus, some people think that Jesus is going to just blow in like the wind and we're going to be set free. It doesn't say that. It says that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Um, I have found when I'm in some kind of an addictive behavior, I don't care what it is, could be cracking my knuckles. I don't care what it is. Could be popping my bubble gum. I don't care what it is. When I find myself in an addictive behavior, if I pray and go to the Lord, seek His Spirit, yield to Him, He will give me what I need to recover myself out of the snare of the devil. Sometimes it's just a verse. He just runs it through my head. He says, Nat, you need to say please, I'm sorry, and thank you. And then I go and I put that into practice and I find myself being set at liberty. Sometimes I go to Him and say, God, I can't stop gossiping. 
and he says, do this. Sometimes I go to him and I say, God, I can't stop doing this. And he says, do this. So that I can recover my... You've got to want it for yourself, guys. We tell people that all the time. I can't want recovery for anybody else. I can't want liberty for anybody else. I can only want and liberty and recovery for myself. I don't want to be in bondage to anything. I don't want to be in bondage to anything. But I also don't want you to be in bondage or addiction to anything. So I'm telling you that in here are the secrets to recover yourselves out of the snare of the devil. You don't have to be taken captive by him at his will. You don't have to fall victim to sneaky flesh. You don't have to swap one addiction for the other. You can find lasting, real freedom and liberty through that relationship that's with the Lord Jesus Christ. They shall know the truth, the truth shall make them free, and he is the truth. He's the one who sets free. You've got to have that relationship. How do I have that relationship? Well, that's kind of a part two to this video, but let's do it real quick. You, if you want to build a relationship with me, what would you have to do? Talk to me over a recording? This is very awkward. I don't think I'm relationship building right now because you can't talk back, right? Same thing here, right? Same thing whenever I monologue a prayer at God. That's not a relationship. That's one way transmission. A relationship is when two people, God's a person, Holy Spirit's a person. When two people come together and talk about life, when two people share circumstances and share life, that builds that relationship. That's how you build a relationship with God. I take God everywhere I go. He lives in my heart, but I make sure to talk about it on the way. I'm in my car driving. I'm like, Lord, how do you think today's going? Hey, Jesus, can you bless my daughter? She's graduating soon. God, she might have some troubles. The devil's going to set some snares for her. Can you watch out for her? Because she doesn't know that yet because she's young. God, can you watch over my son? He just bought a motorcycle. It's worrisome, but you're God. you got angels. Can you put angels around him? I'm just driving. What am I doing? I'm building a relationship. And then I'll shut up and I'll say, God, what do you want me to do? And sometimes God just says, keep doing what you're doing. Sometimes he says, get in your Bible more. Sometimes he says, you need to pray more. Sometimes you need, he says, you need to be more intentional in your ministry. Whatever it is, that's how you build a relationship. If you know the Son, the Son shall make you free. you got to build that relationship, guys. And the Holy Spirit will begin to have his work, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I hope this made sense. Um, it's something I've been wanting to tell you for a while. Don't swap addictions for addictions. Find real freedom in Christ. And um, the only way to do it, you're going to have to spend time with him. You're going to have to spend time with him. There's no, you can't take a pill. You're going to have to spend time with him. He's our freedom. He's our liberty. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for loving us. There might be somebody here who doesn't know you as Savior. They just need to get saved. Jesus Christ died on an old rugged cross, bore their sins, died, and three days later rose from the dead, showing that the death had no power over him. And they need to put their trust in you for the forgiveness of their sins and for their hope for eternal life. And if you're a Christian here, God wants to work in your life as well. And in both cases, he wants all of us to have real liberty. He came to set the captives free, not to move you from one cell to another. God came to work in your life just like he came to work in mine. And he did that not so that we would serve ourselves, not so that we would use it as an occasion to the flesh, not so that we would be tricked by our sneaky, sinful flesh, but so that we by love would serve one another, that we by love would worship and honor God. Christian, you're not going to get around spending time with the Lord. You have to do it. I have to do it. It's where liberty is. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope this was a blessing to you. Don't forget, jump over to the Facebook page for First Baptist Church of Streetsboro. 11 o'clock in the morning, we'll have the church service, and 6 o'clock in the evening. And then on Tuesday, 7 o'clock, we'll have the, uh, the Bible study. We're getting into Genesis 17, I believe. They have been good. We're laughing, we're crying, and we are enjoy enjoying the Word of God together. Um, we also have a YouTube channel. It's called Streetsboro RU Addiction Recovery. Easy to find. Just search it out. There's probably a hundred videos out there now, 
and um, I encourage you if you've missed some to go back and watch them um, call each other call each other uh, make sure everybody's doing okay and uh, think of Kara and I we're getting ready we're gonna be um, um, up uh, at a hotel tonight um, just taking care of you know we're celebrating Hannah's graduation so just be thinking about us um, we've got my brother here mind in the house and um, so everything's okay but just be thinking about us and um, I appreciate your time. Amen.